At concerts featuring Ives' music, program notes often mention the score to Ives' third symphony traveling with Gustav Mahler back to Europe in 1911, with speculation on what a different history Ives would have had if Mahler had lived to conduct the work in Vienna. But there's really no evidence Mahler even obtained the score, let alone brought it with him on his final return trip to Europe. Ives only makes one claim about Mahler encountering the score to the Third Symphony, and it's found in his memos, written in the 1930s. But there's an additional tidbit in the memos, an amplification of the original claim, not by Ives himself, but by John Kirkpatrick, Ives' posthumous amanuensis. This tidbit had previously been asserted by Henry and Sidney Cowell in their book on Ives. All the lore about Mahler's brush with Ives' Third Symphony flows downstream from the three statements. These claims and their logical possibilities, or impossibilities, are the subject of this video series, with an original theory as to what Ives meant presented as an alternative to the conventional story. Without further ado, here are the claims that stirred the tempest. The only text by Ives that connects his Third Symphony with Gustav Mahler comes from his memos, edited by John Kirkpatrick. On page 121, Ives writes, quote, When this, the Third Symphony, was being copied in, I think, Tam's office, Gustav Mahler saw it and asked to have a copy. He was quite interested in it, unquote. And that's it. That is all that Ives wrote that connects his Third Symphony with Gustav Mahler. He doesn't mention it anywhere else in his writings, not even in his correspondences. Special thanks go to Tom Owens, editor of Selected Correspondence of Charles Ives, for confirming this about the correspondences. The claim that Mahler not only saw the score, but also obtained it and returned to Europe with it, comes from three early Ives scholars who knew Ives personally. They provide their claims not in expositions on Ives, but rather in footnote commentaries they left on Ives' writings. Their personal connection to Ives makes them seem trustworthy. The first two are the composer Henry Cowell and his wife Sidney, who together wrote the first biography of Ives. The third is the pianist John Kirkpatrick, famous for premiering Ives' Concord Sonata. Kirkpatrick organized all of Ives' manuscripts after his death and then prepared the publication of Ives' memos, in which Ives makes his one and only claim about Mahler and the Third Symphony. The Cowles and Kirkpatrick are the real sources of the amplified Mahler story, sources traditionally considered trustworthy because of their first-hand knowledge of Ives and their friendship with him. But a close analysis of their work on Ives' text reveals editorial liberties and illogical conclusions that allowed them to amplify Ives' sole claim. But there's yet another source of the ives Mahler story, a version that doesn't come from someone who knew Ives, but a version more elaborate than the others, and which sadly still has currency. It comes from the Ives biographer, David Wooldridge, who made the astonishing claim that he met an elderly percussionist in the 1950s who had played the work under Mahler in Europe before Mahler died. But no one, not Wooldridge, not anyone else, has ever identified the percussionist or substantiated Wooldridge's larger claim, so it has been universally dismissed. We've now introduced the main players in the drama. In the next video, we'll expose what the Cowles got wrong in their book. We'll then conclude with a video that tackles Kirkpatrick's mistake, and we'll explore an alternative take on the symphony's possible brush with Mahler.